Ladies and gentlemen, online viewers worldwide, welcome to the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Rule of Law. The 2020 Tang Prize in Rule of Law is shared by three non-governmental organizations. They work in different areas of the world, but share the virtues of promoting the rule of law where it faces severe challenges. Today, we're honored to invite the three laureates to share with us their experiences. May I now invite Dr. Ye Junrong, Chair of the Tang Prize Selection Committee for Rule of Law, to introduce the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate. Dr. Ye, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2020 Tang Prize in Rule of Law is special in that it was jointly awarded to three international non-governmental organizations. Each of them has made remarkable efforts in advancing the rule of law in their respective societies, overcoming the challenges unique in their surroundings. One common approach shared by all three organizations is strategic dedication, that is, instituting legal proceedings aiming at acquiring rulings of the court so as to bring about progressive changes. That is the common theme. It is a series of laureates lecture. How does a group of researchers initiate progressive social change for the benefit of wider population? That is the mission taken up by the scholars who established the Justitia, the Center for Law, Justice, and Society. The Justitia is special in adopting an amphibious approach, combining research and activism. Based on their research, they identify key areas for human rights. The example you are going to hear in this lecture are same-sex marriage and poverty, and devised strategy to acquire court rulings in making social changes possible. In their words, the court is an important tool for social transformation. And in this process, the scholar in the Justitia have played a critical role. In their lecture, the representative of the Justitia also remind us the importance to have balanced view about strategic litigation. The pitfall to be avoided is the politicization of the court. And it's very important to keep elements crucial for judicial independence in healthy function, including presenting vibrant legal arguments based on solid legal research. The perspective of the Justitia on strategic litigation will be shared by Vimean Newman Point, the executive director of the Justitia, and Rodrigo Uprimi, the co-founder of the Justitia. The title of their lecture is Strategic Dedication, Democracy, and Social Change, a Perspective from the Justitia and the Global South. Vivian and Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Strategic Litigation, Democracy, and Social Justice, a Perspective from the Justitia and the Global South, by Julio Primi and Vivian Newman. Have a good day and let us start by thanking the Tang Prize for this honor of co-laureating the Justicia together with Legal Agenda and Bella in the rule of law category. In this short talk, we want to discuss one of the main tools of our work, strategic or public interest litigation, as an instrument of democratic transformation as well as for social and environmental justice. We think that this discussion not only has an academic interest for those scholars present in the room, as it raises a classical but still relevant question of the capacity of law and litigation to achieve progressive social change. In a period in which public interest litigation has become a global phenomenon, it also has a practical interest for the civil society organizations that are present today as it shows the potentials, but also the limits of this instrument for their own work. For that purpose, we have divided our talk in four parts. We begin with the Justicia's perspective on public interest litigation. Then we provide evidence of our own work as a powerful instrument for democratization, as well as for social and environmental justice. 
Next, in a more analytical and critical way, we also show its limits and risks. And finally, we make some remarks about the lessons learned in our public interest litigation developments. So we'll start with the concept, strategic litigation, social justice, and democratization. Throughout the creation and development of the Justicia, we have assumed the challenge of being scholars while involved in social activism for human rights and the rule of law. We try to bridge both poles by merging the rigorous search of truth and knowledge with the passion for finding and the concrete and practical solutions to social justice. While our activism and struggle for rights takes place in different scenarios, such as capacity building, advocacy on public policy, and influencing public opinion with campaigns and media, an important part of this work takes place in courts, throughout strategic litigation, impact litigation, or public interest litigation, which we assume as synonymous expressions. In a nutshell, we understand strategic litigation as the presentation of one case of, or one intervention before a judge, a court, or sometimes before a semi-judicial body, such as an international human rights treaty body, with the purpose of achieving broader changes in society. In our perspective, these changes should go in favor of social and environmental justice, or democracy and human rights, especially of the most disadvantaged populations. Our goal here is therefore not limited to obtaining a favorable judicial ruling in a particular case. Instead, we aim to instigate broader social effects such as empowering certain marginalized groups, changing attitudes, and pushing towards a democratic reform. We are referring to our specific reform of democratic, litigation, democratic strategic litigation or strategic human rights litigation as some call it, to emphasize that it pursues democratic and social justice goals, while other actors, such as corporations, also develop their forms of strategic litigation, but in order to defend privileges. Thus, it is a contested, or at least, a varied field. The Justicia is also an academic center of research. The ideas developed, as well as the evidence found in our research nourish and feed the arguments we present to the judges in our strategic litigation. Why? Because very often the realization of rights does not advance due to a lack of arguments and evidence that civil society may offer. Because with certain frequency, accountability of the government does not work automatically, but requires judicial decisions. And because the rule of law may and must act as part of a transformation tool. Hence the need of this bridge between academic theory and real justice. Finally, it is not a coincidence that public interest litigation is also known as strategic litigation because we need a clear strategy if we want to have a successful impact litigation. That is a litigation which is able to obtain judicial decisions that spur large-scale social changes and advance and strengthen human rights, particularly of vulnerable or marginalized groups that would not have their voices heard in this scenario otherwise. This strategy implies obviously some important legal points. We need to select the adequate cases, analyze the possible legal arguments that might be persuasive, explore the possible problems of the implementation of a successful ruling, and evaluate possible backlashes. However, producing legal arguments and sharing them in courts is necessary, but not sufficient in public interest lawyering. Since we are moved by the aim of social transformation, we try to protect the situation of vulnerable groups whose voices are not strong enough to be heard or considered by certain sectors of society. So we make special efforts to disseminate our arguments by means of writing them in opits in the media, producing communication pieces, 
and in general, structuring a campaign that conveys the message required to achieve social change. In our experience, this strategic thinking for public interest litigation involves probably 10 steps, as we describe in a manual that we have elaborated in tandem with Legal Agenda, published in 2020, which we encourage you to read. So first, we identify a legal the injustice to be remedied. Second, we envision the goal. Third, we develop a, a legal strategy. Four, we identify the parties. Five, assess the risk and resources. Six, collect the evidence. Seven, develop the legal arguments. Eight, to build an outreach strategy. Nine, ensure that a win is effective or at least investing in a loss. And 10, learning and retooling. So this is the general concept of strategic litigation. I will now proceed with the possibilities uh, in, that are shown in some examples of successful strategic litigation. Strategic litigation works with positive impacts for social justice and democracy, at least in some fields and contexts. These impacts are of very different nature. They can go from the material benefits obtained directly by the parties or the members of certain groups to which the parties belong, to the symbolic and emotional impacts of the litigation in society, through the changing of social views in relation to a social actor or to an issue. Public interest litigation can also produce changes in law, judicial precedents, adoption of public policies, or creation or transformation of public institutions. So I will mention in that respect some impacts obtained by the Justicia in its strategic litigation, usually in association with other human rights or grassroots organizations. The first one relates to same-sex couples which until 2005 were not legally recognized and suffered deep discrimination. Not only they could not marry or adopt, but also they were excluded from social protection as couples. The Justicia, in alliance with other organizations, especially with Colombia Diversa, developed a careful litigation strategy during several years to overcome this discrimination. We obtained several rulings by the Constitutional Court that achieve legal equality for same-sex couples. Today, they can marry, adopt, and have social protection exactly as heterosexual couples. This conquest of legal equality for same-sex couples is in itself very important in the fight against discrimination, but it is also changing the hearts and minds of Colombians, which is also as important as the recognition by the law and by the courts. Peasants, and this is the second case, face in Colombia extended poverty, due essentially to extreme land concentration and the lack of appropriate state policies. The problem is aggravated because the state does not collect accurate statistics on their specific situation. In 2016, the most important peasant organizations in Colombia asked the Justicia to support them in their struggle to obtain official statistics that would allow an improvement in the policies for rural population. We launched with them a litigation with the motto, if we want peasants to count, they should be counted. The Supreme Court accepted our argument and asked the Colombian Official Department of Statistics to collect specific data on peasants. Thanks to that ruling, today we have this information that confirms the dire social situation of the peasants, a very important step to improve the policies vis-a-vis -vis the peasantry and to contribute to reduce rural inequality, one of the most crucial problems of Colombian democracy. In 2010, and this is the third and last case, Supporters of President Uribe in Colombia launched the possibility of a referendum in order to modify the law to remove a prohibition of a third presidential term. As Uribe was very popular, he would probably have been re-elected if he would have had the possibility of running as a candidate. 
and he's very authoritarian. A third period for Uribe would have undermined very seriously the rule of law in our country. Many civil society organizations, amongst which the Justicia, developed strategic interventions before the Constitutional Court to avoid a third presidential term for Uribe because of its deep negative impact on democracy, on separation of powers, and on human rights. This collective litigation was successful and Uribe was not able to run again as a candidate and had to step down as president. The rule of law was therefore preserved. I will now hand the floor to my colleague Rodrigo, who will share with you the limits and some final remarks in this strategic litigation talk. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, the previous examples have shown that strategic litigation can be a powerful tool for fundamental issues such as one, protecting discriminated minorities such as LGBT population, two, defending democracy against authoritarian governments, or three, combating economic inequalities. However, there is also a very important academic evidence that in many aspects strategic litigation does not work properly, or even worse, it can be counterproductive for social justice and democracy. Thus, a balanced view of strategic litigation needs to reflect on the limits and risk of strategic litigation. First, strategic litigation presupposes a legal and political environment. At least two elements are crucial. The existence of rule of law is necessary for successful litigation, as it requires not only clear general legal norms, respected not only by individuals, but also by authorities, with separation of powers, and especially independent judges who decide according to normative standards and proven facts. And second, courts should be accessible and have the possibility and will to invoke human rights, not only civil and political rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as to use their legal powers to remedy structural injustice. Without these two elements, strategic litigation might be impossible, or at least very difficult. However, we must stress that these factors are dynamic and have a complex relation with strategic litigation. Sometimes we can even use strategic litigation precisely to create and strengthen the, pro the preconditions that make it possible a successful strategic litigation, even if that sounds paradoxical. Indeed, litigation could and should also be used to defend and improve the rule of law, as shown with the litigation developed against the third presidential term for Álvaro Uribe in Colombia. Besides, in some contexts, one of the main aims of strategic litigation is to transform judicial culture in order to increase the commitment of judges with human rights. For instance, several NGOs in Latin America developed in the last years a creative public interest litigation to induce national courts to apply in domestic cases the international human rights law which was, in some fields, much more progressive than national law. Second, even when preconditions for public interest litigations are met, and with this develop a strategy that sounds reasonable, nothing guarantees success. The litigation can fail as courts can reject the claims. In other cases, even if we achieve a good ruling, litigation might appear too costly or take too much time compared to other strategies, such 
as direct advocacy before the legislative or the government, or in certain cases, the implementation of the decision might be very difficult or even impossible. Third, in some cases, the situation might be even worse. A failed litigation can reinforce structural injustice because the rejection of the claim by courts might provide some legitimacy to this injustice. A well-known and classical example is the 1896 case Plessy versus Ferguson of the United States Supreme Court, which legitimized for half a century racial segregation in this country, with the infamous doctrine of separate by equal that was only defeated in the well-known decision of Brown versus Board of, of Education of 1953. However, these decisions in which courts reject our litigation, which are in principle a failure, are not always totally negative, because those rulings can have other positive positive events if we take advantage of the situation. They can stimulate a public discussion or on the issue or trigger a political response by the government. For instance, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we undertook a strategic litigation on behalf of a group of vulnerable women who were excluded from a program of cash transfer created to alleviate the impact of the pandemic. The reasons to exclude these women from being beneficiaries were not transparent and were not clear. The purpose of our litigation was not only to protect these women, but also to make more transparent and accountable this important social program. The litigation fails, as the judge, judges, showing a very conservative perspective, preferred not to question the program, leaving these women's fundamental rights unattended. However, the litigation and the publicity we made of it in mass media and social media triggered a fruitful technical conversation with those responsible of the program in the government. Thanks to that, transparency and rationality of the program were improved. As a result, some of the women we represented were included in the program. The failure ended in some kind of a victory. Finally, strategic litigation has at least two important political risks for the very fact that it relies on the role of courts and judges. First, strategic litigation intends that courts, who are not elected bodies, adopt decisions that with huge impact on society. Thus, according to some critics, this leads to a sort of judicialization of politics as crucial aspects of society are decided by courts instead of being left to the deliberation and decision by elected bodies, as should be in principle the case in a democracy. According to critics, this judicialization of politics not only impoverishes democracy, but also creates a risk of backlash because it can trigger attacks against the decision adopted by courts as a result of strategic litigation and even attacks to courts themselves. Second, and directly linked to the previous phenomenon, strategic litigation might also affect the legitimacy and independence of the judicial system not only because of the aforementioned attacks against courts, but also because political actors understand that courts are becoming 
a crucial actor in the political system and try to control them. Thus, according to critics, this can lead to a politicization of courts and the judicial system which is, which is not healthy for the rule of law. With that, we can come to some final remarks on strategic litigations. We have shown with concrete examples that public interest litigation can be a crucial tool for upholding human rights and combating structural injustices. However, we have shown also that strategic litigation has not only limits, but also that it might be counterproductive and imply important risks for democracy and rule of law. Thus, the challenge for those organizations interested in using strategic litigation and as an instrument for social and environmental justice is to maximize its democratic impact while at the same time recognizing its limits and minimizing its risks. There are not easy ways to achieve simultaneously these goals. But our re reflection on our own experience and the academic discussion on the subject give us some lesson that we like to share with you. The first lesson relates to the importance of the continuous defense of judicial independence and commitment of judges with human rights, as the judiciary receives constant pressures from different public and private actors. This is presently the case with the pharmaceutical demands of confidentiality of the COVID-19 procurement contracts that affects globally the right to access information and the rule of law. In Colombia, in response to a disclosure request in which the Justicia contributed to challenge the opacity of these contracts, the judges ruled that these contracts did not incorporate business secrets and that states have an emphasized responsibility to apply the standards of access to information so that public opinion and citizens can debate ideas and ask for accountability. The government contested the ruling and demanded for the judiciary to suffer any economic consequence on public health that the disclosure of the contracts might produce. In addition, a couple of pharmaceutical companies demanded the reopening of the proceedings to protect confidentiality of the contracts before a high court. In these cases, civil society must foresee and counterbalance these public and private strategies that put pressure on judges based on a false dilemma between public health and transparency. The second lesson has been correctly st stated by Helen Duffy and is stated by almost all the best practitioners in the field. And is the following. We should appreciate strategic litigation because it's a powerful tool in the struggle for social justice. But at the same time, we have to demythologize it because litigation is not an almighty panacea. It has risks and is just one among several other instruments in these struggles, such as direct advocacy with political bodies, protests in the streets, or intervention in public debates, just to mention some of them. In many cases, in many cases those other tools might be more powerful and less costly and risky to obtain the same goals pursued by strategic litigation. The third lesson is to emphasize the importance of ex-ante strategic planning as we need to evaluate 
realistically not only the possibilities of success in a specific litigation, but also its costs and risks before presenting a case. In that evaluation, it's crucial to make the comparison with other tools for realizing human rights and strengthening democracy. Uh, in our experience, this analysis has led us in the past to the conclusion that specific litigation should not be carried on. The fourth lesson seems contradictory to the previous one, but it's not. We should not overemphasize the role of, it, of this ex ante strategic planning because we do not have control of the evolution of the context and the legal actions developed by other actors. Thus, we have to remain flexible and be prepared to, rev to revise our decision if the context changes and consequently, consequently our strategic evaluation, which should be a permanent process, also changes. Let us illustrate that with one example. In 2010, we took the decision to postpone for some years any litigation in the context contested subject of adoption by same-sex couples. We thought it was a very difficult case to win and that might trigger a backlash. However, in 2011, an American journalist adopted two Colombian brothers. When he was going to return to the United States with his children, the Colombian official institution in charge, in charge of adoptions revoked the adoption when the journalist informed them that he was gay. He decided to present a judicial a, a action against the reversal of the adoption and he came to us to support him. In spite of our previous evaluation, we took the case because we knew that anyway the judicial action would be presented. And second, we thought that it was a very good case to combat social prejudices against adoption by gay people. The journalist was denied the adoption only because he was gay. And these children were very difficult to adopt as they were already grown up. We decided to litigate the case, but accompanied it with a huge media campaign, supported by several LGBT organizations, to show how inhuman and discriminatory would be to reverse this adoption. With this media campaign and these legal arguments, the Constitutional Court took the case and ruled in our favor, saying that adoption was not forbidden for single gay persons, a first step for obtaining, some years later, adoption by same-sex couples. The four previous lessons and the last example led, led us to a fifth lesson. Strategic litigation is not about a great legal argument made by a brilliant lawyer in a single case in a hearing before a Supreme Court, with the fate of millions of disadvantaged persons depending on the decision of that tribunal. That scene is for a nice Hollywood movie, but reality is more complex and muddy. Strategic litigation is, as many scholars stress, more a, a process with several cases than a single case. Besides, it's not only a legal strategy, but involves other tools of advocacy, such as mobilizing grassroots organizations, developing media campaigns, or gaining the support of powerful actors, or at least taking action to reduce their opposition. The impact of litigation goes beyond the legal procedure and even the court decision, as we saw in the case of the program of cash transfers. Thus, we agree 
with just this initiative that we should go beyond the, an approach that sees the impact of strategic litigation as a binary win or lose result in a single case. This vision is restrictive as it cannot analyze what advances can be achieved both inside and outside the courtroom as a direct and indirect result of litigations. That is why strategic litigation should be seen as a multidimensional, multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, iterative, and composed of several stages. Finally, the previous consideration led us to a crucial sixth lesson. Strategic litigation requires lawyer and legal expertise. That's true. However, it should not be an isolated enterprise made by law firms or legal activists. If we want to increase its transformative and democratic potential, strategic litigation needs to be articulated as long as possible with grassroots organizations, especially those who might be affected by the decision. The appropriation of the result of the judicial de decisions by its beneficiaries is crucial for the effectiveness of a successful, successful litigation. In summary, using the words attributed to Clemenceau that war, that war is too serious a matter to entrust only to military men, we think that human rights strategic litigation is too serious a matter to entrust only to lawyers and judges. Strategic litigation should be seen as part of a broader collective effort to achieve social and environmental justice. It needs citizens and grassroots involvement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Newman and Professor Uprimni for sharing with us your experiences of working in de justicia and advocating and promoting human rights protection through strategic litigation. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Rule of Law. Please do join us in the other two sessions of the lecture series, which will also be posted on the Tang Prize channel. Thank you and goodbye.